Any football fan worth the salt should be able to recite this remarkable story. One of the greatest underdog achievements in football and history. Can we imagine a time when it was truly about the game, not the money? About proving yourself. About representing your country. This story is fueled purely by ambition every step of the way. It starts with the formation of a tournament in one man who made it into a position to make it possible. An entrepreneur way before his time by the name of Sir Thomas Lipton. Tea trading grew his empire into the global brand that is still dominant today. Thomas Lipton is an interesting character because his history is actually from my hometown. When I was a young lad running about Belfast, Lipton's was one of the biggest grocery shops in Belfast. And that's how I first knew the name Lipton. So when I hear come here and hear the name Thomas Lipton, I'm immediately thinking, is this the grocer? So I looked into his history and indeed it was. What we know about Sir Thomas Lipton is what's sort of in the, in the general media, which was that he was an entrepreneur, he was a yachtsman, he enjoyed his sports, he enjoyed his football. He was a bit of a rebel against the FA and he wanted this competition. When the FA refused to accept it, he just went ahead with it. He became very friendly with the Italian royalty. And they decided, because he had done so much for charity and he had done so much for so across the world, that they awarded him a very prestigious Italian reward. And he was so impressed by this that he said, well, look, I love football as well as by yachting. Would you like a trophy for people to play for? But it must be an international trophy, a world trophy, and I must have an English team in it. It was genuinely the first World Cup that he now put up and invited Switzerland, Italy, Germany and England to go and play. And so that's where he comes into the picture and he names this cup the Sir Thomas Lipton Trophy. You know, some, some people said that because of his connections to the North East, that it was intentional that he invited West Auckland. Now, we don't know whether it was supposed to be us or, or what it was. You know, there's many different aspects of that tale. If you can imagine the scene, here's a group of miners. They've got out of the pit and they're told, you're going to Turin. As I say, they never traveled outside of Durham. They hadn't a clue where Turin was, but here they are and they're excited. But the problem is, of course, the club is nearly bankrupt. There's no money. I think the mine at the time was a, a killer, but everybody was a miner, you know. And I think it's very hard to, to do that and play football as well. Because I think they used to go for pints before they used to play then. Yeah. We'll have four or five pints before they'd come well, across and play. But I think football was the out. You know, they were in the, down the pits, working hard to get a meagre allowance and try and survive. And football was their out to uh, try and, you know, get that energy out and, and meet their friends, etc. Most of them were proud enough to pay their own way but there was still a lot of money short. So they had some of them sell their valuables and borrowed money, but they knocked it together and they set off on this amazing journey. I don't think we can really imagine what it's like. There's no airplanes, there's no you know, cheap tickets. You're on a train, you're down to the boat, you get on the boat, you come off the other side, you travel through France, up towards Italy, towards Mont Blanc. They see all these scenes. We looked a lot at the history of the time, which was, which was, it was, gold dust for us, so so flight had literally just, the, the Wright brothers flew the first flight a couple of years earlier than that. Cinema wasn't even in the UK. Electricity had only just come to the UK, unlikely to have come to West Auckland at the time. So there was all this stuff that was happening. The Titanic was just being built in Ireland. There was all those huge steps that hadn't quite happened. Something of this kind will never happen again, not least because football at all of the levels is about money. West Auckland had no money. They didn't have two pennies to rub the backsides with as the phrase goes. And somehow they found the money to get all these lads on a, a train and a boat. As you know, it has been told, but it certainly deserves telling again because it is an incredible story, a truly incredible story in that you can hardly believe it.
I mean, we got in touch with Dave Thomas, the England footballer, and he was brilliant. Because one of the players was his... Taysa, Taysa Thomas, Thomas was his Thomas, grandfather. Yeah. And it, it was really good because um, the BBC came to film in West Auckland and they interviewed Dave and Dave took them to the, the, the back of his grandfather's house where he learned how to play football. Incredible story again. Here's a guy who played for QPR, played for Wolves. Uh, Burnley, wasn't it? I think Burnley as well. What a, fant- a, a great footballer. Played for England, obviously. Grandfather played in the first ever World Cup for West Auckland in 1909. He was captain and they won it and brought it back to West Auckland, which is to think of a team of miners leaving West Auckland in 1909 to go to Turin was just unthinkable. But they did, and they won it. He was a wonderful grandfather. I was in, he was in his early 70s when I was born, and he taught me football. He taught me to be a footballer, no question. Because Dad was working, he was retired, and we were very lucky enough, again, a stone's throw from this football club. We had a wonderful recreation at the back of my dad's garden, and we're out there every day. Every day he took me out playing. And he was a wonderful granddad. We're very, very lucky to have him. This is a miners team from the pits of Durham in West Auckland coming over to Turin, taking on Swiss champions, taking on German champions. And they walk away with a trophy. You tell me, where do you get a story like that? But they shouldn't have been there, really. There's no way they should have been playing against big European football teams. But they went there, they travelled all the way there, yeah. by boat for God knows how long, and got there and beat two big European teams. Stuttgart, I remember. Yeah, yeah. And a Swiss team that nobody could pronounce. Winterthur, <laughs> they were called, but I don't well know. Well done, well done. I, I told you, I've done my research, man. <laughs> uh, but it's an amazing story. The Lipton Cup was abandoned in 1910 citing organisational problems. However, in 1911, West Auckland returned to Italy to play against selected international talent. This time, the cup would remain with the victorious team for good. Now, the thing was that they had to bring West Auckland back because they were the holders. And the, the agreement was that if you come back and play the game, and if you win the tournament again, you can keep the cup. So. West were up for it. But the best thing about the 11 tournament is when they get into the tournament final, who are they playing? Juventus. They have this thing where they are still not seen as a great team for some reason. The Italians still can't give them that uh, uh, accreditation that they're going to do it again. There's no way this team is going to walk away with this trophy again. That was the belief of the Italians. The Italians says, we are going to win it. Our pride as Italians means we're going to keep this cup. Before you know it, it's 3-0. Juventus cannot believe it. How on earth are we down now 3-0 against this English team? We are supposed to be winning this cup. The crowd are now getting worse. It's nearly getting violent with the crowd because this is the Italian pride. This is the cream. What are they doing? Four goals, five goals. They just cannot compete with this West Auckland team. Eventually, the Juventus get a corner and they score one goal. 6-1. 6-1. Now the beauty of the thing about this, and this is the wonderful thing, how do you think the West Auckland village heard about this victory? A postcard was sent by Todd Riley to his mum, and it's got one sentence on it. I hope you're all well. We won the Cup 6-1. That's the announcement. They've just won the trophy for the second time. They can now bring it home and keep it. And he writes back, we won the trophy last night, 6-1. The big problem is, is the history books don't record it. Even the guys who went didn't think they were creating history. That's the problem for most of these stories. The people who were involved don't think their lives are really important or interesting. And yet they're the most interesting people. In 1982, the World Cup of Captain's Tale was released. 
broadcast nationally, it told the story of the West Auckland miners' triumph to a new generation. A story that never got the recognition it deserved at the time or in the years that followed. Dennis Waterman got, got the story. He picked the story up and uh, he got involved with the football club to, and I said, well, why don't you come and help us and come and play a match round on the field? And he said he would do his best to organise it. Well, they stopped in the manor house and I, we got sponsors for that on the night. They had a good night, Dennis and them, without a doubt. And they came down here on the Sunday, of packed in here, packed. Because they were talking, Jeff Hurst was playing, Martin Peters, all World Cup winners. It was a very important film because it got this story out into the public and people still remember it with a lot of, um, you, you know, a, a, a lot of sentiment. Very sadly, it was stolen from the Working Men's Club. They were able to buy it and uh, they had a replica made. But uh, very sad, it was never found that, never found that cup where it went. Probably all melted down now somewhere, but it's quite a shame really. Wonderful, solid silver it was, amazing, amazing. This is the one that was made by the silversmith as a replica from photographs and what have you and replaced it. But the original trophy is gone and, you know, probably melted down by now. And no one knows, suspicions were raised about this, that and the other, but there was no one knew where exactly it had gone. We have done well over the last, what, 10 years, where we've been to Wembley twice, which a lot of teams will never get to Wembley. You know, you've got Sky Sports, you've got matches on TV, that you've got the... Uh, the teams playing locally around here, you know, you've got Sunderland, you've got Middlesbrough. Um, so it's a, it's a certain breed that want to come to these games. West Auckland, when they went to Wembley, there was probably nobody left in the town because they were all at Wembley, you know, people want success. And that's what, that's what West Auckland have brought even in the last few years to the town. And they give you an identity, football teams give you an identity and a bit of pride. Have you all round here? And let's take it off, take off again. West Ham's going to a new era, and that's what we're trying to do. You take the Liverpool's achievements, you take the Arsenal achievements, you take the Man United achievements, the Man City achievements. All these great stuff that's happened. No one can deny it. it's amazing. But you look at what's behind that success. Billions of pounds got that success. Here you have an event, twice winning an international world trophy, on a pittance just for the passion of the game, and they brought home those trophies. Who else could claim to have won the cup twice in England? Not the English team today, 66, still hasn't happened again. West Auckland, twice in two years. They've got something to teach the English team. Who deserves the bigger credit in terms of footballing history? Is it the people who play for the money, or is it these guys who went out there and played for the passion of the game? I say it's they who played with the passion. It's a massive, massive part of people's life. You'll always get your, your West Auckland fans here, the diehards, absolutely. The present West Auckland players, you can ask any one of them, any one of them, when they were kids, what would they want to be? A professional footballer. Now, the net and the appeal is wider and there are people coming in from across the North East and beyond, I gather, uh, who are in interested both in the club and its potential and the story of the World Cup from 1909-11. Um, and all those things together suggest that West Auckland should have a very bright time ahead. Our cup of tea is a story that should be in the hearts of all true fans of the game. We should all celebrate the men who fought for England's national game, an era when football was football, a time we're not likely to see again. <laughs>